You just had a chance to see Brinsley Ford. He was being blue in the film. He was the star of the film. And uh, he'll tell you about something about his journey, how he came to represent in that way, which was really unusual at the time. It's a little bit, a little bit emotional for me because this is a Time Out cover. I wrote a cover story on this film when it came out in 1980. And uh, really, due to the efforts of a man standing over there, Gabrielle uh, Perotti, yeah. If it really wasn't for his righteous efforts, this film might have continued to be lost. So, and this is really the first time that America has had a chance to see this film. Why? Because it was regarded as a threat. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy film, isn't it? Dis, despite the humor. I mean, that's one of the great things that uh, the script writer Martin Stellman managed to achieve, you know, is that balance between the humor and the literally it dread in a Babylon aspect of the film. We haven't got very long together before the next showing, actually, so where's our... Where's our lads? I'm going to interview them briefly, and then we're going to be able to throw it open to the floor. Them soon come. <laughs> Friends in Dennis. Here they are. Yeah, here they are. Can't take no more of that. Bomb did it, I did it, I say wait. Bomb did it, I did it, I say wait. Can't take no more of that. Ali Cloud, I say wait. Can't take no more of that. What was that? I was said Lion! 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 It's very exciting, really. Did, did you ever realize that the film would have a revival in this way and that the work would stand up and be moving people or, you know, that we'd get a chance to experience this? Because, ooh, here you well, go. Well, I always hoped yes. that, you know, the American public would get a chance to see yeah. this work because uh, this work is very important mm. uh, in documenting the way how Britain was and still in part is, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I'm very glad that um, Mr. Karoti yes. decided to make it happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, big up, thank you. Big up, Gabriel. If you get that mic, and we'll, yeah. we'll swap right. this mic yeah. between us. <laughs> yeah. We swapping mics. Go ahead, well done. Now, Brinsley was a very pioneering actor as somebody of Caribbean descent, descent in the UK. Did you have a lot of role models and please tell the people how you started out? Well, I started out way down in 67. Uh, for those people who uh, lived in England or grew up in England. Okay, come on, make yourself known, represent. <laughs> Do you remember Saturday morning pictures? This is to tell you how old, you, okay. Double-decker. All right, well, before the double-deckers, remember? Saturday morning pictures were local cinemas, and they opened their doors maybe about nine o'clock, and parents would take their kids along, and there was a song they sang there, we come along on Saturday morning. And basically, the Children's Film Foundation made films for children, acted by children. And that's where the magnificent six and a half, uh, that's where I entered into it. And it was the predecessor to, uh, as someone said, the double-deckers. It was um, six kids 
who had a hideout and just you just think they got into just crazy things they made a piano they just lots of different things um, so that's how I got into it uh, later on uh, things like do you remember please sir okay and and then um, diamonds are forever but getting back to to the double deckers that was the first real kind of show that was shown on British television where you had real children playing real parts and doing crazy things like getting locked up in a film studio or doing things like that. So, uh, But was there a punk element of you making it up as you went along in the sense, did you see a lot of other faces of colour on the British TV screens or even hear the reggae music on no, the BBC I think radio? I, I, I've been, been said to have been the first young black uh, actor on British TV that most people can remember. Um, and a lot of this has, has been really pioneering, I think, uh, even the band that I formed, Aswad, and the music that Dennis with Matumbi did, we were pioneering at that time. I mean, it's now we look back in hindsight and, and, and you know, people say, well, did you think about this? And we just knew that we could make good music, and that's what we did. We just knew that we can act. We didn't go to drama schools, we didn't do this, but we had the opportunity, and I think we just got up and just did these things. Yeah. Dennis, a lot of this film is based on some fairly traumatic incidents that you went through on the sound system scene, so maybe you could tell them about that, but I'd also like to ask you at the same time to explain what it was like when you as a sound system tried to go out and get a location, a venue, you know, because we would be dancing in squats a lot of the time. Right? Absolutely. We used to call them shabines, mm -hmm. which is a word that came from Dublin, <laughs> right? Um, well, at the age of about 17, I decided that being a sound system DJ was the thing I wanted to do then. And uh, we put a sound system together and went to challenge all the big sound systems in the same way that Idle Lion kind of was challenging Shaka. Uh, at one such challenge one evening in a club called the Carib Club in a place called Cricklewood in London. Yeah, Cricklewood, Cricklewood Broadway. I mean, you, you might want to know that there was a club not far away called the Galtimore, which was an Irish dance club hall and that never got raided but ours got raided like three times a month so it was nothing to um to see police officers walking through the crowd um and lifting someone just taking them out well this particular night they did that and um there was a sound clash between my sound and two other sounds count nix and lord coos and um that day lee scratchberry had come to london and uh, my friend Larry Lawrence had um, kept him away from all the other sound systems because he had, you know, a quantity of dub plates that we wanted to be the first to unveil in London. And we knew he'd sell them to, every, you know, whoever came, but we wanted to play them first that night. So um, Bunny Lee, who is his arch enemy, was also in the dance hall and... Uh, this was a time when Johnny Clark was doing his first tour of the UK. And uh, my band, Matumbi, were Johnny Clark's backing band. In fact, Matumbi had backed uh, Pat Kelly, Ken Booth, Johnny Clark, I Roy, Derek Morgan, you know, Nicky Thomas. We were the fave band to back singers coming from Jamaica. So we had my sound system had all the Bunny Lee plates because, you know, he was with uh, Johnny Clark. And, um, but those sound systems didn't have the Lee Perry. So Lee Perry gave me this dub plate and, and um, it started off like a jazz tune. And then brah! And when I put that record on, the crowd was upset. And it was obvious that I was the champion there that day. <laughs> you know, 
The amount of noise they made, there was no contest. At that time, some people decided to grab the prisoner away from the police in the, you know, the whole up. And uh, a fight ensued and they forced the police out of the, the club and the police came back some 400 strong with dogs and a couple of girls got bitten by dogs. Um, people were thrown across the railings into police vans. The next day, I'm in Ladbroke Grove, and my friend says to me, what are you doing here? I mean, what? You should be hiding, man. What do you mean hiding? It's like, the police are looking for you. So, brave as I was, down to the police station, I've heard you're looking for me. What do you want? <laughs> they pulled me in and accused me of starting the fight. They said that I had got on the stage with a microphone in my hand and G'd up the audience against the police. That was so untrue. And I said, well, you'll have to prove that in court because I'm not pleading guilty to that because it's not true. Until then, I had never believed that police officers would enter a courtroom, put their hand on the Holy Bible and perjure themselves. In fact, at one point, I insisted that the, the trial judge bring a lie detector into the courtroom. At that time, he said, do you expect me to believe that police officers would lie on the roof? I'm going, mate, you, this is a perfect example right here. Get the lie detector test in it. I'm still willing to take one now. You know, well, the first court case lasted for six months. I was six months at the Old Bailey. In court number one, where they tried IRA um, suspects. And after six months, I had a hung jury. So I presented that, you know, a man is innocent until he's been proved guilty. A hung jury means you haven't proved my guilt. The judge went, yeah, we're moving the goalpost, boy. We're going to try you again for this. So the original trial, there was 12 people charged with causing an affray, and I was defendant number one. The other 11 people who were supposed to have been my gang, I didn't know any of them. I had never met any of the other 11 defendants. You know, so at the end of the first trial, nine people were acquitted. Can you imagine? 12 people charged, nine people acquitted, three people left. You should presume their innocence. But the judge said, no, we're going to try you again. And they tried us again, and that trial lasted for three months. At the end of that trial, the jury still couldn't make their minds up. So the judge said, we'll take a majority verdict then. Move the goalposts again. Because it's supposed to be all 12, or it doesn't work. Then nine of them said, yeah, he's guilty. Because they probably wanted to go home after, you know, being in this deliberation all that time. And three people, thank God, stuck out and said, we're not saying he's guilty. That gave me grounds for appeal. So I appealed. And then in front of the central criminal courts, I was released. Uh, and uh, one of the remarks of the appeal judges was, how in the hell did you ever get charged with that? There was no evidence to even bring that charge against you. But you cannot have any compensation because the, the reason you got found guilty is because the jury didn't understand the judge's directions and the judge had actually directed them to acquit you. So were you able to give this story to the filmmakers? Because they knew about it. That film, that, um, that story was all over the press in England at the time. I mean, the, the, the trial had cost some £400,000 in 1970 you know, which was a hefty size of money. So um, there was pages and pages in the tabloids about it, you know. And so when Franco Rosso, I met Franco when I was producing, the director, the director yes. I was producing Linton Kwesi Johnson. Uh, his first, dub yep, yes. yep, the inventor of dub poetry, I like to say. <laughs> um, and uh, this was his first album, Dread, Beat and Blood. And we were doing a documentary um, on, on Dread, Beat and Blood, and Franco was um, directing it. And he said to Linton, I'm doing this film, you know, would you like to partake in the making of the music? And Linton went, you must be mad, that's Dennis's job. 
So he approached me and um, I read the script and I was in. I mean, I immediately recognized parts of, you know, yes. my trouble in there. Yes, and that's what I was... On the right hand side. <laughs> Pass the mic, yeah, it's a new one. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Brins, um, you know, it's very fraught and I could feel the audience completely being with you when you were on the run in this sort of dark, dark night of the soul that you experienced, you know, in, uh, was that very like your experiences with the police, both yours and, and your mates? Well, they've never chased me down like that, but uh, it felt real enough while we were doing it. Mm. Um, my jaw took quite a battering. But I mean, we've had experiences, and I think one of the things in the, when the film was made is that uh, an example, Carl Hallman, who played Ronnie in the movie, while we read through, he was astounded. It was like, no, come on, police are not going to bring, you know, he said a party. Police are not going to bring dogs into a party, or this would never happen. Um, and there was films and actual documentation that we could prove to him that this happened. Um, I think, in hindsight, 40 years on, I think yourselves as an audience are much more aware of these things than probably the audience was in 1980s. Uh, we were living it. We could identify with it. Um, but a lot of people who probably saw the film and the, the, the people who rejected the film for America mm. had no idea of what was really going on on the ground. So I think that was the, the, the difference. I think there's one more point I'd like us to make before we turn it over to the audience, which is that uh, very often in the film you see the letters NF, National Front, um, that was the racist party which, you know, now many people feel has its equivalent in the UKIP party in the UK. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, I, I, I mean, my opinion on, on, on this is that we have been kept ignorant to the contributions that have been made by different ethnic you know, majorities. If I asked any of you here, have you any idea who Lewis Latimer is? No one here No. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, we can say, of course, but I mean, that is, what, 2% of the whole audience who know who Lewis Latimer is, and they use the invention of Lewis Latimer every single day. But why is it not been taught in schools? Why do I not say that name? If I say Thomas Edison, okay? Right, Lewis Latimer, okay, a young black inventor, was the person who invented the filament that we use in a light bulb every single day because the original invention, invention lasted for a few minutes. It burnt out. Now, Lewis Latimer was also, he was the draftsman that got the patents for Thomas Bell, for the telephone, and Edison, and many more. I mean, the traffic lights that we use, Gareth Morgan. I mean, I can go on and on and on and on, you know? Until we have that knowledge, until that knowledge is shared and imparted, we'll always have that ignorant, I would, I would say, really human preservation. That's really what racism is, you know? And there's always someone to come in and stir the pot and make people of a, of a majority community get offended by those who are trying to make life in that situation. And in, in the 80s, we had the National Front. They were the ones that were basically, you know, we saw as the racist situation. But 19, 2018, we had those same kind of values and views seen when Britain went to the referendum. And basically, they didn't vote on the situation that they were faced with. They voted on the immigration. And this time, maybe it wasn't, it wasn't black and white. It was Eastern European people were coming in, and they see them as taking all the jobs. So that thought process still remains. Mm. It's still there. And 
I think one of the things that the film suggests, and I hope many of us here agree, is that music has a role to play in changing people's minds. Mm. And I hope we all agree with that, everybody here in this room. Well, everybody loves music as far as I know. And, and that, that really is a vindication you know, of um, the struggles that we see in the film. We're going to have to throw it open to the audience. Where's Gabrielle? Thing, can I say one thing before Gabrielle gets here? Yeah. Um, music, for, music, sport have really been the, the things that have broke, broken down barriers. You know, rock against racism, things like that, broke the barriers down. And young people started listening to all different types of music. But I think what the importance of films like Babylon does is with music, we can all listen to it and all come to our own conclusion about what it means or what it's trying to say. With films, we all see it. It's there. We, we, when it comes to question it, it's something that we've seen, that we've used our vision yeah. to do it. I hope Gabrielle's going to come down so I can, don't have to talk Gabrielle, anymore. Gabrielle, Gabrielle, do we have time we have for a couple of questions? For... Yeah, we only have time for one question. So gonna, after this, they're going to go down to the um, lobby and you guys can hang out. Be available for dialogue. Any questions from the floor, please? All the way up there. Somebody there with his scarf, a lady? All the way up. Hang on. Oh, Let's just yell it out. I just wanted to know, I really appreciate it, so I'm from the Bronx and my family's Jamaican and my husband's a sound man mm. um, from Kingston and I think that this is not something we see, movies made like this in America, even though there's such a strong Jamaican community in the Bronx and Brooklyn and I just wanted to know like if when you, at that time when you were doing sounds, did you travel to other parts, did you travel to the Bronx or travel to Brooklyn or travel to other places where they had the <coughs> Jamaican um, diaspora? Yeah, we traveled all over the UK. I mean, every, every night of the week, my sound system would be in a different part of the UK. So um, it would be the same as traveling all over America, although the distances would be a bit shorter, but it would be to the whole nation that we were playing. And you could bet that any two out of three nights, the police would come and say, turn that noise off. They still do. The they still do. Well, nothing's new then. Okay. Well, I'm back to Jamaica on Sunday, so... Yeah. Well, everybody, thank you so much. The time has come. Thank you very much. Dennis Cabell, the dub master. Grinsley of Aswan, the man they call Blue. Before we go, can I ask you, you know, in this age of uh, selfies and technical things, if everyone can stand up, I want to do a, a, a selfie. Oh, yeah. Where if we face this way... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Right? Enough noise! Enough noise! There's Vivian! Yay. I'm Vivian Goldman, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. One love.